and we'll get rolling. Oh, here we go. Well, welcome everybody. It is uh, March 16th. I'm State Senator Mark Cran, March 16th, uh, 2022. It's uh, about 3.19 p.m. This is the Legislative Audit Commission and what we'll call to order, order the Legislative Audit Commission. We'll do that, um, kick it off with the attendance roll call and then we'll move on to our report. Please do the roll call. Good afternoon, this is Shelly Gilb and I'll take the roll. Senator Cran. Present. Senator Benson. Representative Bernardi. Representative Erickson. Senator Frentz. Representative Hansen. Here. Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Klein. Representative Liebling. Representative Pearson. Pearson here. Representative Kwan. And Senator Rest. Um, present. And I, I see that Senator Benson is also present. Thank, Thank you. you. That ends the roll. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ms. Gilb. And uh, um, Representative Kwam will try to join. He contacted me earlier and he will try to join. So, so with that today. And, and, uh, Senator oh, Coran, I think Senator maybe, Russ? I think maybe um, we should count um, Representative Erickson who was here as long as she could be before we started the meeting. I think we should ca count her as present as well. Senator Rest, I would agree. So if we could indicate um, Representative Erickson as present. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rest. And with that, so before us today, we have a, a, a release on the unemployment insurance program and its efforts to prevent and detect the use of stolen identities. So with that, Ms. Randall, if you could uh, kick it off and state your name and your position for the record, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Judy Randall, I'm legislative auditor, and I'm pleased to be here to release our last report of the season um, to the Audit Commission. Um, today, we're releasing our report related to unemployment insurance and a specific type of fraud, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair. Before we get into the details of this report, though, I do want to note that our evaluation, our, our evaluation involved a significant amount of not public data. Now, you all know that OLA has the authority to review and analyze data classified as not public, but we cannot, of course, publicly report that data. As a result, we are somewhat limited today in what we can share here with you in this presentation, and also we are limited in what we can include in our public report. You will see that significant portions of the report are redacted. Um, however, the team worked really hard to ensure that the summary of the report provides at least kind of the broad strokes of our findings and recommendations so that legislators, um, other interested folks, the public is, in general can gain an understanding of what we found. And we did provide a full unredacted version of the report to DEED and to the Unemployment Division within DEED. Um, and I will note that a large number of the recommendations are directed to the agency. And so they, of course, are able to see all of the evidence supporting those findings and recommendations. When it comes to unemployment insurance, there are several different types of fraud. And our evaluation focused specifically on one type of fraud. It's a fraud related to stolen identities. And this type of fraud can happen when an individual pretends to be someone else. They either apply for the benefits in that person's name, or they try to take over an existing unemployment insurance account and pretend to be that person. It's a very specific type of fraud, and it's one that we believe has not otherwise been audited or examined. Um, it's also a type of fraud that has increased in prevalence over the past two years. And so that's why we chose to focus on it in this evaluation. Um, to get more into the details, again, that we can share um, of our findings and recommendations, I would like to now turn to Ms. Laura Schwartz, who is the manager of this evaluation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Thanks, Ms. Randall. And so, Ms. Schwartz, if you would, uh, please state your name and your position, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Laura Schwartz, and I'm with the Office of the Legislative Auditor, and I'm here today with uh, Scott Fusco and Stephanie Best, who also worked on the evaluation. And if you just give me a moment here, I'll share my slides. All right, um, is everyone able to see my slides? Maybe someone can give me a verbal confirmation. Yes, we can see it. Thank you, Senator Coran. Yes. 
All right. Um, so as Ms. Randall just explained, many of the fraud prevention and detection processes uh, that we reviewed as part of this evaluation are not public under state law. And so as a, as a result, we redacted significant portions of the report. Um, but you can find most of our findings and recommendations in the summary that appears at the beginning of the report. And then I'm, of course, going to go over um, them today. If you give me just a moment, we're having a, a little bit of a technical difficulty. All right, I think we're good now, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna start with our key findings. Um, we found that the Department of Employment and Economic Development, also known as DEED, uses a variety of processes to prevent and detect the use of stolen identities in the program, in the UI program, uh, the Unemployment Insurance Program. We found DEED's processes generally to be effective, but we also found that DEED does not collect uh, the data necessary to evaluate these processes sufficiently, and it has not established metrics or methods um, for doing so. Now I'm gonna back up and talk a little bit more about the program and provide you with a little bit of context um, before I get more into our findings. The UI, the UI program provides cash benefits, as I'm sure you know, to eligible individuals who lose, lose their jobs. The program is a joint operation of the federal government and the state government, and DEED, or the Department of Employment and Economic Development, operates the program in Minnesota, um, and the U.S. Department of Labor, or USDOL, as I might mention later, is responsible at the federal level for a variety of things, including um, setting program policies, ensuring state programs comply with federal law, developing performance metrics, and monitoring state's performance, among various other things. The federal government pays for all of the program's administrative costs, and employers pay for benefits through quarterly taxes or reimbursements. And typically, none of the program's funding comes out of the Minnesota General Fund. As you might expect, the COVID-19 pandemic had significant impacts on the UI program. The unemployment rate reached 11.3% in May of 2020, which was higher than during the Great Recession. In response to the pandemic, both state and federal policymakers made a number of temporary changes to the program. The US Congress offered benefits to individuals who aren't normally eligible for them, like un uh, excuse me, um, self-employed workers. Um, and Congress also offered benefits for extended periods of time and provided supplemental uh, payments to individuals on top of what they would normally get. And as you might remember, the governor also uh, temporarily suspended various program requirements through an executive order. For example, he temporarily suspended what's called the non-payable week or the waiting week when individuals usually don't get benefits during that first week of eligibility. Um, and the legislature later passed that temporary suspension of the um, waiting week into law. And I'll note that that, that suspension has expired. Um, initial applications for UI benefits rose significantly during the pandemic. According to figures that DEED reported to the U.S. Department of Labor, DEED received an average of about 250,000 initial applications per year over the last five years. But in 2020, that figure rose to about 1.7 million. And according to figures that DEED reported to the U.S. DOL, uh, DEED paid out about $4.8 billion in benefits. The influx of applications during the pandemic, plus those policy changes that I talked about, um, impacted DEED's ability to perform some of its normal fraud prevention and detection processes, which I'll discuss later. Like any large cash program, the UI program um, is susceptible to various kinds of fraud. For example, employers um, might try to misclassify their workers as independent contractors to avoid paying UI taxes, or they might misrepresent an, elig um, an employee's eligibility for benefits. Or similarly, uh, applicants might try to misrepresent their eligibility, such as whether or not they were discharged from their employer or about whether or not they were working while also collecting benefits. I wanna be clear in this evaluation, we focused very narrowly on how deed prevents and detects fraud from two kinds of fraudsters, imposters and hijackers. Imposters, um, are fraudsters who use the stolen identities of individuals to apply for benefits in their names, whereas fraudsters take over real applicants' accounts to divert their benefits. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the scope of our evaluation. This was a large program, and there are a lot of different things that we could have looked into and that other auditors have looked into. Um, and we chose to focus on imp imposters and hijackers for a few different reasons. First, 
Imposter and hijacker fraud is an emerging issue uh, and it became a lot more prevalent during the COVID-19 pandemic. Second, Imposter and hijacker fraud is an area that OLA hasn't previously looked into. Our financial audit division has reviewed various aspects of the program, including the extent to which DEED correctly determined applicants eligibility, paid the correct uh, benefit amounts and recouped overpayments. And third, this is an area of the program that's under greater state control. As I mentioned, the US Department of Labor is responsible for monitoring various aspects of the program. It conducts its, um, a variety of its own audits, tracks various performance measures, and oversees various quality control programs that DEED must participate in. For example, one of those quality control programs, um, DEED is required to regularly analyze samples of UI accounts to estimate its overpayment rate. And federal data from uh, that program estimated that DEED had an overpayment rate of 10.7% for fiscal year 2021, which translated to about an, an estimated um, two point, excuse me, $259 million in overpayments. Finally, because of OLA's authority to look at not public data, we felt like we were well positioned to um, look at imposter and hijacker fraud um, because so many of those processes that DEED uses are not public. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal requirements. Basically, DEED has quite a bit of flexibility under the law over the kinds of fraud prevention and detection uh, activities that it conducts. State law requires DEED to prevent uh, waste or unnecessary spending of money, but it doesn't really say much at all about the specific activities that DEED needs to conduct um, to prevent fraud in the UI program. Federal law is quite a bit more complicated. Uh, in order to qualify for federal funding, state programs must meet various requirements, um, which the, the US Department of Labor is responsible for overseeing. For example, as I mentioned, um, DEED is, is required to operate various quality control programs using federally um, established methodologies. The U.S. Department of Labor also offers guidance to states about the kinds of activities that it recommends. Um, so, for example, it recommends that states um, do various data analyses to um, try to detect fraudsters using various characteristics. Now, I'll go over at a high level some of our um, some of the processes that we looked at that Deed uses to prevent and detect hijacker fraud. And I'll just reiterate that. I can only say so much here because some of the information is not public. At the start of the pandemic, DEED received an increase in UI fraud allegations from the public. And during the start of the pandemic, DEED created a new form on its website to better receive um, those allegations. And in fiscal year 2021, DEED received nearly 24,000 fraud allegations from that new form, form on its website. Most of those reports uh, contained allegations related to imposter and hijacker fraud. We analyzed a sample of those reports and we found that DEED staff quickly reviewed and took steps to uh, address the allegations in those fraud allegation reports from the public. We also reviewed data analysis processes that DEED conducts to prevent and detect imposters and hijackers. And again, because these processes are not public, I'm not going to go into detail about them. But I will say that um, DEED regularly analyzes program data to identify and lock accounts with suspicious characteristics that indicate they may have been opened by imposters or hijackers. I can also say that we reviewed a sample of accounts and found that DEED's processes were effective in quickly identifying and locking most of the suspicious accounts in our sample. During the pandemic, DEED also created another set of processes to prevent payments to imposters. Again, I'm not gonna go into those, um, into the details about what those processes entail, um, but I will say that DEED instituted them um, in reaction to various challenges that were presented by the pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, um, there was a, a big influx in applications and DEED said that influx in applications plus some of the policy changes that I mentioned earlier made the program a more attractive target for imposters. Um, so for example, as I mentioned before, applicants were eligible for larger payments and the non-payable week was suspended, um, which meant that DEED didn't have time to, to screen new accounts, didn't have the normal time that it would have had um, to screen new accounts. So in response to these ch challenges, DEED implemented these new processes that we looked at. And we found that um, uh, these processes prevented payments on new accounts by more than a week. 
Uh, the new processes that DEED implemented also provided time for DEED to stop initial payments on suspicious accounts. In June of 2021, DEED stopped payments on about 2,500 suspicious accounts, which was more than a third of all the new accounts opened that month. We also found that while DEED's processes helped prevent payments on suspicious accounts, they also likely created burdens for some genuine applicants who were entitled to benefits. We recommend that DEED develop processes to proactively investigate accounts that may be incorrectly identified as suspicious to reduce delays in payments to genuine applicants. While we were able to conduct certain analyses to assess the efficacy of the various processes that I just mentioned, we also found that DEED has not collected the necessary data to evaluate them su sufficiently. And, for, and, and DEED also has not established me metrics or methods for evaluating those processes. So we recommend that DEED do a number of things. Um, we recommend that DEED establish metrics and methods for evaluating its processes, collect the necessary data to do that, evaluate its processes on a regular basis, and use the results of its evaluations to refine its processes, both to ensure that those processes are effective in identifying uh, imposters and hijackers and to reduce the uh, potential impact they might have on genuine applicants. Finally, I'll mention one other finding. The US Department of Labor requires state UI programs to report on fraud in their pro programs in a, on a quarterly basis. And the graph on this slide shows that the amount of fraud that DEED reported to USDOL declined significantly between 2019 and 2020. But we found that for a number of reasons, only some of which I'll get into, um, these reports do not paint a full picture of the potential fraud in the program, particularly from imposters and hijackers. For example, deed reports to USDOL only cases in which it has determined that an overpayment was made, and deed doesn't report cases in which it cannot identify the imposter or hijacker who received the overpayment, which is common in imposter and hijacker cases. It also does not report suspected but unsuccessful attempts by imposters or hi and hijackers. And we also found that state law does not explicitly require deed to report information about fraud in the UI program excuse me, to the Minnesota legislature. So we recommend that um, to enable the legislature to be better informed about the possible vulnerability of fu public funds in the program, the legislature could consider requiring deed to report to the legislature on both the level, uh, levels of confirmed fraud in the program and on suspected fraud attempts by imposters and hijackers. Mr. Chair, um, that concludes my short presentation. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to try to answer members' questions, the ones that I can, um, and I can do that either now or after uh, the department has their response. And I'm gonna go ahead and Swartz. stop thank sharing you, my screen. Yes, thank, thank you, you Ms. Swartz. And uh, so what we'll do is I think we'll do, what's uh, let's have the agency on, and then um, and then we'll do uh, Q and A after that. So I think with the agency today, we have um, Mr. Evan Rowe, Mr. Rowe, if you want to state your name and your position, and, uh, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair Coran. Um, Chair Coran, Vice Chair Hansen, uh, Legislative Audit Commission members. Uh, my name is Evan Rowe. I'm a Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Services and Operations with responsibility for the Unemployment Insurance Division here at DEED. Also with me here today is James Hegman, who is the Unemployment Insurance Division Director. Um, let me just start by saying, by thanking you for the providing us with the opportunity to respond to this report. Uh, I, and I'd like to thank, uh, to start by thanking Ms. Randall and Ms. Schwartz and the whole office of the Legislative Auditor for this report. Deed values every opportunity to improve its processes and service delivery. And uh, we, again, we appreciate the partnership uh, throughout, uh, throughout this process. I also want to uh, publicly recognize the UI Division's unprecedented, unprecedented efforts during this pandemic. Uh, Deed's dedicated staff in the UI division went to extraordinary lengths to keep the program not just up and running, but delivering efficient and effective services to Minnesotans when they needed them the most. And it's fitting to be discussing this today of all days, as it's the two-year anniversary of what we might define as the program's pandemic response. Uh, on March 16th, 2020, the program took in about 11,000 applications for UI benefits. On the 17th, over 26,000. On the 18th, over 32,000. Uh, ending the week, about 100,000 applications above the program's previous one-time record. I think the, COVID, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Minnesota's UI program and UI programs nationally cannot be overstated. And I reemphasize this 
in the context of this report because it required the program to reorient all its efforts to meet an historic challenge. To counteract the unprecedented impacts of the pandemic, federal and state policymakers, as OLA noted in their report, deployed unprecedented levels of aid and made eligibility changes to the UI programs to get benefits to workers quickly. DEED also identified for the governor and for legislative leaders several temporary changes necessary to the state's UI program that needed to be implemented to meet the moment and deliver benefits quickly. Those temporary changes were some of the governor's earliest executive orders and were later codified by the state legislature. The same pattern played out across the country. The state UI programs were challenged to adapt, and I'm sure many of you remember headlines in other states where UI programs were not as successful at adapting to the change reality as Minnesota was. Altogether, this meant that UI program administrators had to act quickly to increase capacity tenfold while still maintaining program integrity, implementing several new programs, and rapidly moving to new business models and new technology that would permit staff to work remotely while still maintaining critical security elements. Despite all of these challenges, I'm proud to say that the Minnesota UI program responded very quickly. All staff resources were immediately directed to assisting applicants. Program technology met the challenge, permitting over two years worth of applications to be accepted in just four weeks. And the Minnesota UI program fully implemented all new federal benefit programs more quickly than any other state. As a result, the UI program was able to provide the financial support that Minnesotans urgently needed. Nearly $15 billion in benefits were paid to 870,000 applicants and eligible applicants received payments about as quickly as they did prior to the pandemic. As I said before, this was an unprecedented undertaking and one, with, and one which helped Minnesotans weather the worst of the pandemic. The major increases in UI benefit volumes brought on the, by the pandemic and, federal, uh, and the federal and state COVID-19 pandemic response, though, also created an opportunity for cyber criminals, as you might call it. Really, uh, the dark web enables transnational cyber criminals to buy and sell private data obtained from data breaches and culled from social media. Data breaches and cybercrime are unfortunate components of the modern interconnected financial system, and as such, the UI program's emphasis is necessarily to detect suspicious applications and stop as many of them as possible from being processed. The pandemic and the related expansion of federal unemployment benefits amplified these types of attempted actions by cyber criminals. As the report notes, in the month of June 2021 alone, the UI program identified and stopped payments on over 2,500 suspicious accounts, which was more than one third of new accounts opened that month. As the report also notes, the UI program has developed a variety of approaches and business processes to detect and stop suspicious applications. Um, we're, we're, pleased, uh, we're pleased with uh, OLA's finding that they generally found that we took uh, quick action on fraud allegation reports and that deeds processes were generally effective in quickly identifying and locking suspicious accounts in the data that OLA analyzed. Deed's responsibility is to continually work to maintain a balance between stopping cyber criminals and ensuring that genuine applicants have access to the benefits that they're eligible for. And to be clear, this is not a static calculation, but one which will evolve over time and will vary based on both the number of cyber criminals that are active at any one time and the sophistication of the schemes that they are using. In any event, Deed is committed to continually monitoring and updating its approach to detecting and stopping cyber criminal activity and to ensuring that Minnesota's UI program continues to remain resilient in serving the people of Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Chair. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Rowe. And, uh, and, and I'm sorry, uh, Assistant Commissioner Rowe. Uh, so, Mr. do you have, uh, were those the comments for deed or does Mr. Hegman uh, have a portion to add? Those are, those, are, uh, those are the agency's comments and uh, Mr. Hegman on, is on the call if, if uh, in case any specific yes. questions come up. You got the bullpen ready. So thank you. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Bro. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has her hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would say the question, uh, first of all, in reading this report, um, it was really encouraging in many ways uh, to read, especially kind of the metrics of what you had to do in the unemployment division and then to have the legislative auditor comment on your response. And so I, I see a lot of good things here in an extraordinary time, I would agree with that. And do thank those employees uh, for that kind of work uh, during that time. Uh, 
it's a little interesting to see everything, not everything, but to see how many, how much information has to be stricken out. That you cannot read, we're not used to that as legislators. We usually have legislative privilege and get to be able to see that. But generally speaking, uh, we do trust the OLA. My question for you is, it sounds like there is uh, the cyber crime, which whenever there's more money, uh, a lot more happening, you're likely you know, to kind of see that. But it was interesting to realize though that the fraudsters or the imposters and those kinds of areas, uh, the imposters and the hijackers. So with the cybercrime and the dark web, um, sometimes though it's easier to catch them also because it's cyber and you can use digital and electronic means. Um, so I'm wondering, is that a little bit of why you're able to more frequently be successful in regards to some of these imposters and hijackers by virtue of that? Commissioner Roth? Uh, Senator, uh, thanks, Senator Cran. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking it. And I think it's, I'll say it's, it, um, it's both more, it's both, it, it is both more difficult and and it's both easier and more difficult in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, right? I, you know, I think there's a broad spectrum of sophistication when it comes to these types of when it comes to these types of attacks. Some of them are very unsophisticated, and you know, basic web you know, basic web defenses uh, kind of meet the meet the test. Some of these are much more sophisticated. You know, some of them are much more sophisticated. That's and that's why you know I would say that you know we really are employing constant vigilance uh, at the agency um, and within the and within the program to make sure that we're that we're meeting that we're meeting all emergent threats um, because it really you know because there are really there are a variety of vectors and we really have to be playing you know playing defense on all fronts. To make sure that we're staying on top of all of these questions, to make to make sure that we're on top of all these items. So it you know, and and you know, uh, the unfortunate element too, of course, is that um, these tactics from malicious actors are always evolving. So we're so we're constantly having to evolve our approach and shift our approach and adapt our approach to make sure that we are staying on top of everything that's 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 out there. I, I hope that's not too general of an answer, but it, but we have, but we really have to be, uh, we have to be on top of all, top of this on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Senator Kiffmeyer, follow up. Yeah, I would say I understand that. I understand that the, uh, and I thought it was interesting that some are real sophisticated, make it a little difficult. Some are not so much, and a little bit easier. Typical kind of a situation. One of the things in reading your letter of response, though, uh, was there anything? I mean, your response to the legislative auditor was basically kind of saying, well, we're either already doing it or we don't need to do it or uh, we're continuing to look at it. So um, uh, usually um, agencies, um, it's just a little bit different. So can you tell me uh, what one or two areas from the OLA report did you feel you need to pick up and take some action on, especially if it might include legislation? Commissioner Roth? Uh, Senator Cran, uh, Senator Kipfer, thank you. Um, you know, I think one, I think one piece of this has sort of been the big picture, right? Is continuing to work with DOL, uh, United States Department of Labor, on strengthening some of, you know, strengthening some of the national response and sharing our perspective and working on that as we go forward, right? I think as we tried to mention in the tried to mention in the response, there's a piece of this that you know, again, for truly transnational problems. It requires larger scale action than you know maybe an individual state can do, and we certainly want to be a contributor to that solution. And I think the, I think one other one other piece here is just is um, is certainly now that we are getting out you know we're out of the pandemic phase of the unemployment insurance you know of of this response right where we had to deploy unprecedented resources time I mean the, the you saw in the OLA's presentation the volume of applications that we were receiving. It gives us a, it gives us a chance to work on some of the kind of the data the data elements the data structures that limit our ability to report on these things as much as we would have liked and would normally have done. I think some of the points that uh, Ms. Schwartz was making about evaluating efficacy of response are some of those pieces that we can you know that we can turn our attention to to make sure that we're kind of continuously improving those efforts that we're that we're deploying against uh, against cybercrime adversaries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kipmeyer. Uh, Senator Rest. 
Um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm interested in the differentiation between an in, in, in imposter and um, a hijacker, and whether imposters tend to be um, uh, uh, single individuals who are just out for a free ride, quite frankly, and hijackers are more organized and um, in criminal activity. And um, I, I tried to find in, in, in my uh, perusal, I was not am actually able to, um, to do that quickly, but um, where do we get the most fraud? Uh, do we get it from um, imposters where somebody is just saying, well, I'll try this <laughs> um, because somehow I don't have a job and why shouldn't I get unemployment because I don't, I don't work, not because they qualify. And, um, uh, and then the hijackers, they're thieves and they, they know they're thieves. Um, and, uh, or at least that would be the, the way I would characterize it just from uh, ordinary human activity and behavior. But I was just wondering where you found the most fraud uh, and the LAA, uh, the OLA found the most fraud, um, Ms. Schwartz and, Mr. and, and uh, Commissioner Rowe. Um, but um, even if you can't identify it because of um, uh, the non-public uh, characterization of the, of the data, but who is cheating us the most, I guess, is my, is my, um, um, my, um, my question. And I can tell you that my puppy has a very definite opinion of this. And so I will go mute, but I really want to hear. Um... Oh. Senator, you muted yourself before you stopped speaking. Maybe your dog can mute you as well. Gave you my tootie, my 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 um, West Island White Terrier who has a very big voice. Um, uh, so I will now go mute for for sure. But I I really am interested in that. Senator so Rest, your phone muted. Are you? Your, your Where is most now? of the fraud coming from? And. Um, uh, and because the answer to that seems to me to be uh, determines where um, the legislature might have the most um, impact in acting. Uh, and so um, I now will definitely go mute and, um, and thank you for your indulgence, uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Senator Rust. Uh, Commissioner Rowe. Thank you, uh, Senator Cran, uh, Senator Rest. Um, I, so I, I hate to, I hate to give this answer, but I think they're they are both I mean they are both challenging, uh, and 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 I think and you see it shift and you see it shift based on the type of cr uh, criminal activity that's happening happening at a given point. You know, I think maybe just to back up a little bit and where you know how do the, you know how do these things happen right like you know when when we reference for example the dark web and data breaches what does that really mean you know in both cases for you know uh you know for you know in order it's it's um in order to apply for an un unemployment insurance account to begin with you need a fair amount of personal data you need to know quite a bit about a per, you know person's um information, including you know, things like social security number, things like employment history, things like that. So it is a, it is a significant criminal act to, you know, to, you know, in terms of imposters, you're not just, it's not just, you know, somebody, generally speaking, you're not just seeing somebody down the block, um, you know, who would, who would do that. It's, it's, it, it, it takes a lot of effort to be able to do that. That kind of work, Again, that kind of that kind of activity is happening, enabled by you know again uh, sales of personal information from the dark web, data breaches, you know things that can come out of data breaches, 
things that come out of you know people posting too much information about themselves online and sort of collecting that kind of information. So that's you know that's how imposter information can happen. You know, uh, hijackers are it's a different type of problem because when with a hijacker you're taking over somebody's legitimate account and redirecting resources to it. But you know, but it's so it's different types of digital tools, but it's things like phishing attacks. It's things like, you know, creating spam pages to, you know, to confuse people to, to, to make, to, to, to give up their login information. So it's different sets of, it's different sets of challenges, but both are pernicious and both cause, pro, you know, real, pro, both cause real problems. And the team has to take action on both fronts because you know they're they're both going to i think unfortunately going to continue to be a part of the cybersecurity frame that we're operating within so I, i'm sorry it was I, I don't think i can give you like a this or that answer they they both really are important and just to emphasize this is not just a ui thing this is widespread across the whole financial ecosystem um, and something that you know, we're always trying to make sure we're we're adapting to the best practices so that we're safeguarding this information and making it and, and, and the system as best as possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Rest. Uh, Senator Benson. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank Mr. Rowe. My sister-in-law actually was a victim of this fraud and she screenshotted me a copy of the letter and a gave it to my legislative assistant and your team turned it around really fast. And I know it's not just because a legislator's office contacted you. I've now heard from a number of people that you do a really good job of trying to get these things shut down early. So thanks for your diligence. And even though it looks like there are things that can be improved and reports to the legislature that we should maybe be aware of, um, when it comes down to it, you get back to people on cases of identity fraud and, and with really solid advice. Change all your passwords, um, look at your bank accounts, all of those things. So not just solving the Minnesota problem, but giving some good practice advice to people who are victims. So thank you. Senator Benson and uh, Roy, you received that congratulatory message. Uh, wow. I'm, and if, if I could just uh, all credit to um, you know Director Hegman and the and the UI team on that front. They've worked incredibly hard to deliver a pro you know to deliver a program under extremely difficult services under extremely difficult circumstances and provide great customer service and great responsiveness to the people of Minnesota throughout that time. So thank, 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 thank you, you thank you, Senator. thank you, Commissioner Rowe, and thank you, Mr. Hegman, as well for the work. We we do understand the volume of. Uh, and, and what that did and the need to then again, it, the, the need in the it hasn't diminished, right? Only the thieves have gotten more creative and more persistent and they, that's not gonna stop. And so it ties into a, another piece of, in our need to really get our cybersecurity commission from a legislative body really up and running so we can have the conversations that are redacted in, this, uh, in the reports today, as well as I have a whole host of questions because you, you probably don't know, but that's been my entire career is in that world. And so, you know, I, I, my questions is you can't answer them, so I won't ask them. Um, but we really, it, it only emphasizes my need and, and our need to get that cybersecurity going and, and whatever we develop in the secure skip that we have to be able, that we're going to need to be able to communicate to protect and to coordinate all of those cybersecurity threats, it touches every single facet of our, the existence of our government. And so, you know, you're, we're one element, but it's tied, we're, right, we're tied all across in the theft of, of this, the initial theft of your information, which can be used for other areas, um, as well as the theft that occurs on a nonstop basis of, of many who give that information up or provide vehicles to make it easier through phishing, um, and then subsequently used across our various programs. So, we do understand that importance and, and I would love to uh, sit down with you and have a great detailed conversation. We may need to do that in person before we, we get the rest of the Cybersecurity Commission up and running. So um, I have a long history of running through the uh, department, uh, the, the deed um, agencies. My dad was a 35 year employee. So um, a long time ago when you're at 390 North Robert, probably long before you guys got there. Um, but, uh, but have a have a, a need to make sure that we 
we as the legislature have a more active role in that cybersecurity and what do we need to do? One, as an education, and then two, how do we how do we programmatically and systematically support our agencies um, in in technology and funding and, and just just the support in legislation and everything we need to make sure we're um, continually vigilant to make sure we're we're protected. So we, we do really appreciate and understand what you guys have done in the daunting circumstances. It does give us a time to be prepared because it won't stop um, and they aren't going to let up. I think it's how some nations are funding themselves off theft of our resources. <laughs> um, so with that, I don't see any other hands. Um, I, we, I think everybody has expressed the, the, those great questions and those that you can share. We appreciate the work, it's certainly Ms. Schwartz and, and your team, um, everybody who pay, played a role in it. These things are vital. And so we appreciate everybody's willing participation and we'll, we'll continue. It is our last uh, report, I believe Judy mentioned for, the, for this year. Um, and so thank you everybody, everybody who participated. And uh, with that, no further questions, I think we'll adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Chair.